So my name is Jason. I'm here with my colleague, Kevin. We both work on the observability team at Cruise, uh, which is under site reliability engineering. And um, just by way of kind of understanding the audience a little bit here, I wanted to just get a sense of a few things. Can you just like raise your hand or otherwise visually you know, inform me if you feel like you have a good understanding of open telemetry? All right, so that's about uh, 50%. Now, the same question, what about specifically the open telemetry collector, the thing that you can deploy to manage signals? All right, slightly less. Okay, cool. Um, that's good, because the, uh, this talk is going to get pretty technical. Um, this is kind of a report from the trenches of uh, somebody who's doing a kind of a large-scale migration, um, using open telemetry, shifting a lot of existing instrumentation to it. And um, so we're going to get in the weeds. But at the same time, it's going to be kind of uh, not so much ex exactly about how we do it, because we don't want to be necessarily prescriptive. Just kind of showing you some ways you can think about doing this in your organization. And hopefully, it kind of is um, applicable to organizations of various different shapes and sizes and you know, um, maturities. So as an overview, in this talk, we're going to walk you through the thought process that we followed in executing a uh, wholesale migration from one observability vendor to another. In our case, uh, we had historically used Datadog and are migrating um, to Chronosphere. And it's actually funny, I think on Tuesday, there was a panel with a, a charity majors kind of referred to the observability teams as doing vendor engineering. And uh, that felt actually a little too accurate. Because um, that's a lot of what we do is we manage our, uh, the relationship between the infrastructure and the teams and ultimately a lot of vendor products that we are leveraging for, you know, opportunity costs. You don't have to spend all this time owning all aspects of um, observability internally because it doesn't make sense a lot of the time. Um, that said, we're not talking specifically about vendors in this talk. It's more about just the process of migrating and why open telemetry is a great assist in helping you kind of have more technical choice to allow you to make this kind of shift in the future. Um, we're going to tell you some lessons we learned along the way. Kevin is going to give you a deep dive into how we run the LTEL collector at scale for a lot of different use cases uh, at Cruise. And ultimately, what we hope you get out of this is, if nothing else, some confidence that you can start using open telemetry um, in your environment and iterate on it over time as uh, suits your needs. So let's set the stage. Uh, we work at Cruise, an autonomous vehicle company that provides ride hail and de delivery services via a fleet of driverless cars in multiple cities. As uh, said, uh, Kevin and I work on the observability team. So we're responsible for ensuring that we enable um, the development and operations of those services um, to be reliable and also make sure that all of our engineers can be uh, productive with Cruise infrastructure. To give you a sense of scale, we're talking like we have on the order of uh, 100 Kubernetes clusters with thousands of nodes, tens of thousands of pods. And we also have about hundreds, hundreds of thousands of um, VMs that are spun up and down to sort of assist in things like test, training, simulation. Um, so if you've been in this room in particular, in KubeCon, uh, you've probably heard a lot about the benefits of open telemetry. Uh, in my view, OTEL provides two key capabilities. One, it, uh, it unlocks choice, it unlocks technical choice for you as observability. But two, it also um, provides synergy. So the ecosystem of OTEL um, has a lot of weight behind it and there's a lot of nice um, virtuous cycles happening due to the ubiquity of uh, OTEL as an open standard. It's great because vendors increasingly are supporting it for ingest or export or whatever, while at the same time, because of that ubiquity, we get a lot of investment in the instrumentation side. So it's a really nice, um, healthy ecosystem and healthy community right now. Um, and so we basically approached OTEL motivated by a desire to shift our entire observability stack from Datadoc to Chronosphere. It could be that you don't need to do anything nearly that extravagant, um, but we can talk about various ways to um, start depending on what your needs are. So to open up, like whenever we think about oh, I wanted to use this new technology in, uh, in my company. You always have this, this dream is that you, you have a green field. You've got um, unlimited possibility. You know that OTEL, you've heard good things about it, and um, you don't have any legacy systems to deal with. You can just create new projects. You can use the OTEL SDK. You can use the collector, blah, blah, blah. It all works great. You see lots of blog posts about it. Um, 
However, the reality is like we're dealing with stuff like this, where we've got lots of investment um, in legacy systems, things that have evolved over time. In our case at Cruise, we've kind of had some lava layer going on with instrumentation. So you've got like Docstats-D, Prometheus, we had some early open census users and open tracing. Um, there's also OTEL already in the mix in a few different cases. Um, but beyond just the instrumentation and the code, you have all this additional investment on top of that with um, dashboards and alerts and uh, things that people are depending on to do their work on a day-to-day -day basis. At the same time, you've got typically a long tail of a bunch of junk that you don't really care about, nobody's looking at, and you aren't really sure like how important is it. And lastly, at larger organizations, you also sometimes wind up with issues of ownership where maybe entire systems uh, don't have a clear owner, and that applies as well to the observability of those systems and assets. So some of the problems that we faced, um, I didn't say this, but Cruise is actually a relatively old company. I think it's on the order of 10 years. I really should know this, but it's, it's, it's been around for a while. There's been a lot of organic growth that we um, had to take on here. And so one of the problems we faced was, how do we just, just get started to use Hotel and take advantage of being in this ubiquitous, virtuous cycle. How can we introduce this technology with minimal overhead for existing teams? And I'm not just talking about, um, I'm talking about code overheads, so they don't have to do many changes to their code, but also you know, performance overhead and things like that. Um, that also applies to you know, disrupting them in their existing dashboards and monitors. How can we make it so they don't have to rewrite everything that they do? Um, third, how can we do this safely? so that we can transition our monitors and make sure we don't have gaps in, in uh, observability that could lead to us missing um, issues during a migration. And lastly, how can we do all of this at Cruise's scale, which is um, significant? We have some pretty big clusters. So we're gonna talk about taking the first steps. And um, throughout the talk, uh, we're gonna kind of refer to a diagram that looks a bit like this. I think this is basically what observability systems look like if you zoom out in a Kubernetes cluster. So you've got a cluster, it's got a bunch of nodes. Typically you've got a daemon set running. Um, there's kind of no way to get around that uh, on every node. And that daemon set runs an agent that is either vendor provided or you're running it yourself. And that agent has a lot of responsibilities. It handles ingest of, of metrics like statsd or it handles maybe scraping things. Um, it handles getting host metrics, getting uh, container metrics. Um, it does a lot of work. And in other cases like Datadog, they schedule custom checks and they all kind of participate in this sort of check mesh that is centrally organized. So it can really vary how much they're doing. On the side, we have a cluster agent, which is sort of, you usually have some of these things. They're like kind of things that are cluster scoped, like cube state metrics, things that you only want to be running like once somewhere. Another example is if you're pulling cloud metrics from GCP or Amazon or something. Now all of this stuff funnels up into what is just a simple box here that says observability system, but actually that is you know, also a complex beast that has lots of moving parts. But for our purposes here, um, we'll just assume that it's something that can take in signals like metrics and tracing. We're not really talking about logs today, by the way, um, but the same thing would apply. Uh, it takes in metrics and tracing, and then it, it provides a query interface that allows you to um, visualize the data and write alerts and so on and so forth. So one of the first things that we thought about when uh, approaching you know, adoption of OTEL was like, well, what if we just introduce this at the client layer? Uh, we can change the instrumentation from ddtrace or docstatsd and start aligning on open telemetry, take advantage of the instrumentation there. And then we, um, we can do this actually because uh, the Datadog agent actually supports uh, OTLP ingest for both metrics and traces, and it's pretty good. Um, so this looked like a promising avenue. However, uh, at, at an organization of any significant scale, you're going to run into a lot of problems with actually doing this migration. You have to get buy-in from the teams. You have the issue of service ownership. Maybe ser some services are just, it's not, not clear who would do the work. And if you have a lot of systems, you're really signing up for a lot of work that ultimately is realistically going to fall on infrastructure. The other thing that this doesn't solve are things like pull, um, like things that expose Prometheus metrics, which a lot of internal infra stuff does. Uh, so while it could be um, a way to sort of get your foot in the door, especially if your vendor supports OTLP, 
ingest. It didn't really work for us because we had um, more use cases and our organization was just too big for this to be a viable approach. A more interesting idea is to still hold on to the fact that you've got OTLP ingest on the agents, but you can use the OTL collector to kind of sit in between um, the, the agents and your workloads. This, is, this allows you to do some cool things. So you can normalize at this layer, so you can ingest statsd, you can ingest, in our case, Datadog APM trace data, um, but you can do other things there as well, like maybe enriching the metrics from some other sources, uh, performing you know, other normalization sampling perhaps you could do here as well. And this kind of gets you a little bit of indirection between, for example, a vendor provided agent and the rest of your infrastructure. And that can start to um, open the door to more interesting things down the road, which Kevin will talk about in a bit. So I do want to take a, a little step back though, because I talked about how like, okay, we, uh, we didn't go down the SDK route because it was like instrumenting the client because it was too much work. Uh, but you kind of should have a bifurcated approach when you're looking at a migration like this. So you have one way that you handle sort of legacy stuff, and you have the other way that you, you kind of should be prescriptive about what you want new systems to do, because otherwise new systems are gonna come up and they're gonna just keep repeating the same patterns that you're trying to stamp out. So what we did was um, for new systems, we provided a distribution of the um, open telemetry SDK that we wrap up, it's an internal, uh, in this case, we've got it in a few different languages that we use at Cruise, and it's basically the observability library that teams um, are supposed to be using whenever they're uh, um, writing a new system. This is really nice because we can put opinionated defaults in there, so we can make sure that everybody's tagging things in the same way. Uh, we also do stuff where we will provide wrappers of OTEL instrumentation libraries, so we can make sure to um, you know, for example, I'll get into this in a bit, but some instrumentation libraries had problems with high cardinality labels. We could like take care of that and make sure that they only take the, the ones that are kind of blessed by the observability team. The other cool thing about this is it allows us to provide a, a pretty good dev experience to users. Um, and this is something that I think is not often thought about when, especially coming from like a statsd model, where developers are kind of used to just, metrics are kind of like in the background somewhere, and we, we see them when in prod, and we see them in dev or whatever when it's deployed. But locally, the workflow um, kind of sucks. So the cool th part about moving to uh, OTEL is that we can do something where when you're deployed, we set up like a push exporter that pushes to our infrastructure, but when you're running in dev mode, we can automatically set up a local prom scrape endpoint. We can set up things like statsviz, Z pages, and that makes it so that when you're running things locally, you have a really nice feedback loop that actually didn't exist before. And so this is one of those nice carrots that you wanna to give to people when you're trying to get them on board with the new thing. So um, some of the, the challenges that we had, I, would, I kind of think it's required basically to roll your own distro at this point because if you wanna do anything slightly complicated, the off the, the shelf tools just aren't enough. I don't think they can be enough. It's just kind of nature of the beast. You can look at OTEL config go. It's a nice way of simplifying, uh, setting up the metric and trace pipelines in OpenTelemetry. Um, I think that, frankly, OpenTelemetry by itself is kind of a beast to set up and configure. Um, you need probably at least 20 lines of code to, 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 to do it. And so that's another reason why we rolled our own SDK. But it comes with overhead, we have to version it, we have to make sure that we, um, modularize things well enough so that we don't run into transitive dependency issues, but ultimately these were uh, worth the upside. This is kind of like what our library looks like. We just have a, a start function and then a shutdown function. That's basically it. We expose um, some OTEL functions, like otherwise people mostly use the OTEL API. So they just generate metrics, they generate um, you know, counters and, and things like that. And um, we have some other sugar things that we put in there for to kind of um, basically make the edges of the, the, the SDK work a bit better. Uh, some gotchas that we had with this. Probably the biggest one was just being really careful with trace propagation. So again, we use Datadog. Datadog has their own uh, trace propagation format. And um, what's cool though is that sort of more recent versions of DD Trace, Datadog's own instrumentation, they support sending um, W3C trace context, so they support the new way. 
of standing trace context when you're emitting data. But uh, if you have any old clients in your infrastructure, that's no good. So what we had to do, oh, and also the other thing I was going to say about this was Istio, as far as I know, you can only set up one trace propagator format. Like Otel, you can kind of combine them and have a chain. I don't think this is possible in Istio, and we were relying on Datadog at the Istio level as well. So necessarily, we had to basically build in support for um, backwards compatibility for Datadog's format, which is another reason it was nice to have our own distro of the client. I mentioned a few of these other things before. Um, high cardinality metrics have been a problem with the built-in Otel instrumentation. This has gotten a lot better with the realization that this is a problem. Um, but that was something we had to work around in the past. An example is like putting the connection ID or like the, the peer IP address on metrics emitted from HTTP instrumentation, which you almost basically never want for, for metrics. Uh, there's this idea of a view in Otel SDK, which I think is kind of confusing. I would like to see some, some, uh, some better work there. People are kind of used to defining metrics and like histogram buckets like next to each other and the view kind of separates them, which can be a bit awkward. And lastly, if you're coming from the StatsD world, you expect synchronous gauges, but guess what? They don't exist in Otel. And this is definitely kind of a confusing thing for people. Uh, fortunately, I believe this landed in the Otel spec because they recognized the need, and now we're just waiting on SDK support. Uh, in the meantime, we just worked around this. We wrote like a wrapper that made a synchronous interface out of an asynchronous interface. Again, another reason it was good to have our own client. Okay, so um, we talked before, a couple slides ago, talked about how you can sort of get a foot in the door by intercepting things with the collector. Um, but now we're gonna talk about like what would it take to actually run everything with just using the Hill collector, and that's what Kevin's gonna talk about. All right, thanks Jason. Yeah, so I'll talk about how we run the collectors at Cruise. Um, if you're not familiar, a collector is basically a piece of instrumentation infrastructure that uh, receives metrics log traces, uh, processes them, and then sends them on uh, through exporters. Um, it's very composable, and it is a nice layer of indirection, um, especially if you have, let's say, things like multiple uh, vendor backends. So here's a high-level view of our architectures. Um, I'm going to start with our edge, we call them our edge collector systems on the left. Um, these sit in on all of our clusters, so they basically are there with our services. And they collect basically at the edge, so there are certain things we need to collect, like system metrics, um, as well as, uh, you know, the services report directly to them. Um, next, I'm going to move to our centralized ingest collectors, which is sort of our second tier. Um, and it is important to note that the deployment architecture um, has implications on sort of the collection strategy and the telemetry content itself. Um, we kind of learned the hard way that things, uh, having the hotel collector as a daemon set um, versus a deployment um, sort of comes with its own nuanced uh, capabilities. So I'm gonna basically go through all the metric and trace signals that we need, uh, that we needed to replace in this migration and how we architect our collectors to account for this. So the first thing we needed in our migration was replacement collection for our existing uh, ingest. And this is basically StatsD metric ingest and Datadog trace ingest uh, from our services. So you can see here are the existing vendor agent on the left, and the right is basically what we came up with as the replacement. Uh, it is a, it, it basically this collector takes these responsibilities on through the StatsD receiver and the Datadog receiver. Uh, protocols like StatsD require consistent send targets for aggregation. Um, which made daemon set a natural option for us to have these edge collectors um, with consistent you know, source destination endpoint mapping. So we know the metrics are going to the same place. Uh, daemon set bloat is something we always want to avoid, um, you know, the overhead per node, um, but this ended up being really the cleanest solution and you know, somewhat avoidable uh, for our case. Um, we use this level of indirection to basically normalize and enrich metrics before sending them onto the central ingest. Uh, so next, we need a way of implementing uh, system metrics on Kubernetes clusters. These are things like uh, Kubernetes metrics, status of a pod, how many jobs failed, uh, container metrics like, you know, the CPU a container is consuming, as well as host metrics like, you know, the memory usage of a VM or a node. Uh, these previously came out of the box with our vendor agent, 
Uh, so now we basically have to figure out how we're going to implement them ourselves. For this, we leveraged the same daemon set collector instance you saw earlier, and we basically added a series of Prometheus scrape jobs to it using the Prometheus receiver. Um, there already exists an endpoint on the kubelet uh, for uh, host metrics and container advisor metrics as well. Um, so that's where we basically scrape uh, locally from the daemon set uh, to get our node and container compute metrics. Uh, for Kubernetes metrics, we use cube state metrics, um, which provides, as I mentioned, a lot of those uh, you know, metrics that are relevant to the state of the cluster. Um, we run those as a sidecar on this daemon set, and we actually have this sharded along the node. So there's an option in cube state metrics, uh, which basically queries the API server and provides a scrape target to say, you know, I only want to produce metrics based on the node that I'm on. Um, this, you know, sort of horizontally scales uh, the instance, uh, which we originally had as a centralized instance, um, and it greatly decreases the scrape time uh, and the scrape size, uh, and basically unlocks horizontal scaling. Um, so we also have another KSM instance, KSM cube state metrics, uh, for non node paradigm metrics, so things like job metrics or service metrics, uh, it kind of runs off on its own and is not sharded. So coming from the vendor solution, uh, we assume these metrics would have a lot more attributes than they did, sort of out of the box. Um, the metrics from the scrape job don't have exactly the attributes in the way we wanted, uh, mainly because they're from the pre-OTEL days, so you know, really sort of some nuance between Prometheus and OpenTelemetry. Uh, but of course, the Collector provides really great functionality and it's really powerful uh, ability to process metrics uh, via processors in a very flexible way. Uh, first, we have the attributes processor, which updates these data point attributes to match OpenTelemetry's semantic conventions. Uh, OpenTelemetry semantic conventions are basically standard naming patterns that exist, so that way we can unify our telemetry data. So you can see it changed like pod and namespace to the kates.pod.name and namespace. Uh, next, we use the group by attributes processor to basically group these data points into a parent resource. Um, so in open telemetry, there are resource attributes and data point attributes, whereas in Prometheus, you know, there's just a single layer of labels. Um, and this is also a prereq for the next processor we use, which is the kates attributes processor. This basically queries the API server on behalf of that node, similar to how KSM did, um, sharded along the node. And it allows us to map things like the pod, as you see here, the status of the pod, uh, to the daemon set it's on, as well as the cluster it's on. So this sort of decorates it with more contextual information uh, before we send it off uh, to our central ingest. Uh, next, we have a lot of prom uh, local Prometheus scrape targets on our clusters. So, you know, a lot of utility deployments like Istio and Open Policy Agent uh, have Prometheus endpoints. Also, our legacy system supported Prometheus. So many of our existing services are already instrumented in PROM and have the endpoint. So for these, we actually created another uh, edge uh, stateful set collector. So this is another uh, deployment of the collector. And we basically asked service owners to annotate their services with standard Prometheus annotations like the ones you see in the operator. And using the Prometheus receiver, we do service discovery to find these scrape targets, much like you would with normal Prometheus. Um, we then use the target allocator, which actually comes with the open telemetry operator. Uh, this is a tertiary deployment that distributes scrape targets among the collectors. So once again, this unlocks horizontal scaling, and the more Prometheus scrapes there are, uh, the more collectors we can spawn and distribute that, uh, those scrape jobs. Uh, and just like the other collection scenarios, we enrich these metrics and then send them on to our central ingest. Finally, we have use cases like database or device, uh, or network device metrics. And as you can see from the previous part of my talk, these are somewhat orthogonal to our existing collections infrastructure, which mainly sits in Kubernetes. Um, maybe these need to run on other hardware, um, they require niche collector components. And uh, we also have some other teams that own these and would like to handle the collection of metrics themselves. 
So we use the OpenTelemetry operator for deployment and collection or management of collectors. Uh, it's a really nice way of uh, simplifying deployment for us. And we basically allow and even encourage other teams with these niche scenarios to implement their own instances of, the central, of their own collectors. Um, they still report to our central ingest collectors, which still gives us full control of the ingest and the way it's coming. So this covers most of the use cases for telemetry on our collectors. One case study we've had with the collector where we really could not find an immediate solution available upstream is metrics aggregation. So we run simulations on hundreds of thousands of VMs. And while we want to get metrics on them, uh, we don't necessarily need the host level granularity for the cost. Um, you know, you can think it's hundreds or even millions of unique time series. So we came up with a way of basically aggregating them um, to still represent, you know, that population of uh, VMs without all the unique time series aggregated on the back end. So initially we built this with some collector contrib repo processors, um, which worked well. Uh, so things like the metric transforms, the group by attributes, the batch processors, we basically kind of put them together and had to alter them a little bit. Uh, but eventually we made our own custom processor for this. Uh, we used the OpenTelemetry collector builder, which is just a really easy way of spinning your own OpenTelemetry collector image uh, based on just adding and removing components via Go modules. And basically this custom processor that we made is part of that image and it aggregates via accumulated windows in memory uh, and then emits them based on time. Uh, the bottom graphs show the VM counts over time with sort of the out of the box uh, first uh, version we created and then with our custom processor that handles it a lot smoother. And some of the metrics we actually aggregate in histograms. Um, which allow us to have uh, heat maps on really large VM distributions with only a, like a few unique time series on the back end. So like this uh, heat map on the top right, it could only be maybe 60, 70 time series, you know, re representing hundreds of thousands of points or hundreds of thousands of VMs. All these collection systems send to our central ingest. Uh, here we'd normalize it uh, if it hasn't been done already, sample and then route to our multiple backends. Due to the shared services model, uh, we own this cluster as the observability team. So this scenario works best for us. And we're able to roll out quicker, have more control over it compared to the other multi-tended clusters where you know, deployment is a little slower. Uh, but it may differ by scenario and your organi organizational structure. One major benefit of this is it encapsulates observability as a service. So we basically front the vendor backends with our own OTLP endpoint. And this allows for consumable solutions with other teams, as I mentioned earlier. It also gives us a lot of control around the telemetry we send. Basically everything that goes to our backends is coming through here. Um, so we have the ability to also do composite things across clusters like trace sampling if we need to but it comes at the cost of maintaining a really high availability as it is a single point of failure. So that's it for me. Uh, Jason's gonna talk about a few more considerations when doing a wholesale migration. Thanks. Yeah, so with this section, um, we're talking about doing the whole thing. So we talked about replacing the agent on all the nodes and having that be based on things like open, tele open telemetry collector, open source stuff. But now we're talking about replacing the entire observability system and all of the new complexities that you get with that. Um, as I said before, we used to use Datadog for this, and now we're switching to, um, to Chronosphere as our main backend for metrics and tracing. And with this, uh, the sort of the single biggest issue that happens is on the read path. So Datadog has their own query language, uh, and then Chronosphere uses the um, they expose PromQL, the sort of the sort of standard Prometheus format, and these two things are not the same. So there's a huge amount of um, effort that goes into translation and managing um, the translation process and trying to do that in a way that doesn't disrupt the teams very much. Our approach to that is kind of um, a combination of leaning really heavily into automation as much as we can and designing a process that's largely automation driven but at the end of the day, you need a lot of eyes on um, 
the work that's going through. And so um, part of, in our case, we're getting some assistance from our Chronosphere's team to help with translating like dashboards and monitors over. Um, but even with that, with the amount of stuff we have to move, um, we need automation. And by automation, I'm talking like, we have a process where teams will, we'll ask teams to like, hey, go look at all your assets that you have um, in Datadog and tag them all up in some way so that we can find them uh, in some sort of you know, uniform way. That puts some pressure on the team to basically figure out like, what are you actually using and provides a really good first pass at cutting away some of the cruft. Um, and then when we have things kind of tagged up, we have automation that pulls all the, um, the dashboards and monitors from, in this case, Datadog, and we have them in some sort of format. And then we are working, then we work to basically translate that format into, um, in this case, a Grafana JSON dashboard format, which uh, Chronosphere supports. So um, the other cool part about the, uh, the sort of adherence to things like Grafana JSON, it allows us to have more flexibility as well. So you know, we actually, Chronosphere has a front end that has dashboards and uh, a trace product, but we also have other use cases that involve and kind of require Grafana. Like we have situations where we've got data in BigQuery or we want to maybe pull in metrics directly from GCP and that's just not really supported in a lot of uh, vendor products. And um, so we have an internal Grafana as well. Now, uh, it's kind of cool that the Grafana uh, JSON format exists because um, we could have the same dashboard effectively live in both systems if we want. To help further manage this down the road, we've uh, wrote internally a Kubernetes operator that's like the observability operator. And what that does is like, instead of, um, we have had in the past like some, some adherence to config as code and we're trying to lean more heavily into that. And so the cool part about this is you can define like your monitors and your alerts as like Kubernetes custom resources that our operator understands. And then the operator can reconcile them against whatever the backend is. Like it could be that it, it creates a Grafana dashboard CR, which then the Grafana operator is happy to you know, create a dashboard for. Or we um, actually provision it in Chronosphere. And this opens up the ability to um, do more interesting things with monitors and, and things later on, like we could um, have some like monitor redundancy within our cluster if we don't want to have them all firing centrally or something like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, we are using Sloth for SLOs um, because Chronosphere is prom uh, based. And uh, if you haven't heard of Sloth, it is a way for you to define SLO targets and then it will spit out a bunch of um, sort of recording rules and uh, Prometheus alert manager rules that are I use those recording rules and that help you sort of roll up and get the nice SLOs that you want. Uh, this was kind of important for us to tackle because um, Datadog has their own SLO product that we had to, that we had a lot of investment in. Um, as far as monitoring goes, the approach that we've taken and in general for migration, what worked for us was our clusters, we have like a few like gen pop clusters, but we also have some that are more like just a little bit more of special for certain teams. And we're trying to migrate everything on like a cluster by cluster basis. And that's like what we're in the middle of right now. Um, that works the best because it's easier to just turn a daemon set like off. Um, if you can make sure that everything, all the use cases are taken care of. And especially in the case of Datadog, they charge by the host. So you kind of have to turn everything off if you want to um, stop double paint. Uh, we have about like a one month window that we're um, using to s basically move people over to a dual shipping system. All the stuff's going to both places. We make sure that we didn't break anything in the old system. And then we make sure that uh, the new system has parity. And once we have enough confidence in that, we're then able to um, cut the cord and move them over. So that's the way that we've been um, approaching this, but it really is going to depend a lot on, um, on your organization. These are just some ideas. So uh, just conclusion, it's actually a really good time to invest in Otel, actually. Um, there are always going to be little things you need to deal with, but uh, in our experience, it's been uh, pretty nice to, there's a lot of off the shelf stuff that just works and there's been a lot of bugs that have been fixed already by the time we got to them. The Open Template Collector is an absolute workhorse. We use it for basically everything on the right path and we're looking at more interesting things to do with it in the future. 
And uh, lastly, I'll say to read the code because um, the docs could use some work, uh, but the code is there. And the code will not only help you understand uh, sort of how everything is working under the hood and help you with tuning things, but it'll also maybe give you ideas of how you can um, leverage things in the future. So with that, um, thanks very much. I, don't, I think we kind of wanted to give a lot of attention to the content, so we didn't leave a lot of time for the uh, microphone questions, but Kevin and I are more than happy to sit here and have a little huddle with anybody who wants to know more details, because there's a lot of stuff I could, we couldn't really cover here just for, the, for time. But um, thanks very much for coming.